Mark Cote has been publisher of Cormorant Books since 2001. He is, in fact, a multiple award-winning publisher and editor. He's also worked for the Canadian Book Information Centre, Books in Canada, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Canada Council for the Arts. He has run the Literary Press Group of Canada, served as marketing manager for Stothard Publishing, and been associate publisher of Dundurn Press. So that's an incredible variety of jobs you've held in the publishing industry in Canada. Gives you quite a perspective on the whole business. I like to think so. Perhaps we could start then by looking at what you did at these different organizations and and what they're all about, starting with the Canadian Book Information Centre. Ah, that was a very challenging job. I was responsible for placing books back on the shelves in alphabetical order. (laughs) Um, But actually, interestingly (laughs) enough, it was it was a part-time job because I had moved to Toronto originally to be a playwright. From Vancouver? From Montreal. I'd gone to school in Montreal. Um, Where? Uh, Miguel. Okay. Studying? English literature. Ah, you and Justin Trudeau? Uh, a few years apart. 14 years apart, I think. And um, uh, I, I was really lucky. I had uh, Hugh McLennan the last year that he taught at McGill and Louis Dudek in the last years that he taught. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got to have them as great professors and through Louis I got to meet F.R. Scott and um, other kind of important poets like P.K. Page and Phyllis Webb. You actually met them? All of them. Had a lovely correspondence with Phyllis Webb and P.K. Page for several years. The thing about P.K. Page, well she lived in England for a very short period of time but she's got a British accent and I've got to figure that that's fake. It's not fake. Um, it's class. And Frank Scott, Frank Scott had it too. Did you ever meet Frank Scott? Never. Frank spoke with a British accent. It's fake. It's class. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if Frank had a British accent before he went to Oxford. He certainly had it after he came back. Right. And it never went away after. And I would say the only thing about P.K. Page that might be fake was probably the lenses in her eyes. Okay. I think she was a thoroughly authentic human being. Pretentious? Huh? Mm. No. D- 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 she was very, very upper class. In, in, in upper a, class Canadian. Upper No, upper class... <sighs> Canada doesn't have classes. Well, that's why I'm saying the British um, accent is pretentious. But it, it, it comes out of that world that she grew up in. I don't know how old she was when she moved here. I haven't read the biography. That's a Governor General award-winning biography. Yes, it is. It was also nominated for the Charles Taylor Prize. You didn't publish it, though? No, Miguel Queens did. So what is the Book Information Center? The Canadian Book Information Center was the marketing arm of the the Association of Canadian Publishers. And they specifically focused on libraries and schools. And they used to do uh, displays for local librarians, local teachers, and they did this out of offices in Halifax, Toronto, and Vancouver. And so for professional days, somebody from the Canadian Book Information Centre would go out with a collection of important Canadian fiction or important Canadian um, biography and or books designed for the, um, the teachers of that school or area. So they were marketing for... They were marketing for the Association of Canadian Publishers. For the so publishers. through them for the members? The members, yes. And uh, in 1986, they took over the marketing for the Governor General's Literary Awards. So they, in April that year, we or, or, or March, we stuffed tubes and sent out hundreds of thousands of bookmarks and information sheets about the nominees. Um, and they did that for oh, about three more years until the Gigi's were... Canada Council. The Canada Council. Well, they were always the Canada Council. Yeah. But um, in 80, 85, the Council decided they needed better marketing. So they farmed it out to the Canadian Book Information Centre. Um, and it, 
democracy wasn't better because they took it back. Um, it was a very important first step in the marketing of the awards because the awards went from being something that maybe 150 people in Canada were worried about to something that several thousand bookstores and libraries knew about. And back then there were, you know, what, 2,000 independent bookstores in the country. That sounds almost incredible. That's how many there were. There were a lot. The no longer existing Canadian Booksellers Association had all the statistics, but I'm pretty sure at one point they tossed around a figure of 2,400. Do you know what it is now? Uh, if it's more than 400, I'll be surprised. But it might also be that bookstores were considered, for the purposes of CBA, the Canadian Booksellers Association, anyone that sold books. So, you know, Bud's Stationery and Books, or Jill's Newsstand and Books, yeah. would have been a member. I see, okay. So, was this a good idea, this Canadian Book Information Center, or not? Yes, it was a great idea. It was brilliant. And it, be, it got rebranded the Canadian Book Marketing Center, and then in 1995 it was disenfranchised, shut down by the Association of Canadian Publishers. Why that? I wasn't party to it. I had left that world. I was working at Stoddard by that point, okay. and so I wasn't party to what happened. I think it was deemed to have become ineffectual. Any reason? He shrugs. Uh, I honestly cannot tell you. So did, did what happened was that each publisher then took on their own marketing efforts? What happened um, in the five years preceding that was that uh, the literary press group, which I was running at the time for the yeah. five years prior to that, became very effective at marketing its members' books. So those members no longer needed the Canadian Book Information Centre. Okay. And the larger houses, Key Porter Books, um, Stoddard Publishing, Douglas and McIntyre, McClellan and Stewart, were all doing their own. So they were calling on all these bookstores directly? Yes, and, and, okay. and, and doing many of the activities that had been coordinated by the CBA, CBIC and then CBMC before. Okay, then we have Books in Canada. <laughs> I was an editorial assistant, which may, meant I made coffee, opened the mail, <laughs> and I had the chutzpah to actually suggest that I would like to write book reviews for them. And um, the senior staff, both of them, or three of them at Books in Canada, laughed. Who they? Uh, at the time, it was owned by, in part by a woman named uh, Susan Traer, and Michael Smith was the editor or publisher, and Doris Cowan was the managing editor. And um, they sort of sniffed and did not hand me books to review, but I... Um, just get coffee, okay? Just get coffee, yeah. Keep your head down. Yeah. Um, what years were those? Oh, this would be 87, 86, 87, 88. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I... And uh, I'll have cream and two <laughs> sugars, please. That's right. And what happened was um, they uh, received a couriered copy of Swan, a novel by Carol Shields. And the, the publicist for the book, uh, Estelle G, phoned and said, we'd like to take somebody from books in Canada out for lunch with Carol Shields. And the powers that be felt that Carol Shields was such a nobody, they were too busy. So I put up my hand and said, I'll go. So they said, fine. So I read the novel as fast as I could and went to lunch at the Park Hyatt with, with Estelle and Carol. Uh, and we had a wonderful, wonderful lunch. And I came back and I said, why don't I write up a kind of talk of the town New Yorker piece, Lunch with Carol Shields? And I did, and they ran it and everybody was happy. And so they said, maybe you can review books. So mm. I got to review, the first book they gave me was a poetry book. And um, it was Waiting for Saskatchewan by Fred Waugh. And I was told, you know, write a short review. And I did. And I ended the review with, and if there's any justice in the world, this book will win the Governor General's Literary Award. And Michael Smith said, you can't say that. You have no authority. You're just a nobody. And they scratched out the line. 
and then four months later, it won the Governor General's <laughs> Literary Award. And um, of course, it did. One of the other books they got me to review was Doc, a play by Sharon Pollock, and I used that as my closing line. And Michael said, "You know what I'm going to do?" And I said, "Yes." Scratched it out, and of course, several months later, it won the Governor General's Literary Award. Um, I thought to myself at the time, I'm good at this. I'm really good at this. Got a pretty good eye. Yeah. Um, and then I was fired from Books in Canada. Oh, dear. And um, Well, you put, like, one sugar instead of two sugars? No, I, um, I let the powers that be know that I had a better education than they did, and I probably knew more about literature than they ever would, oh, and that I also knew more people in the world than they did doesn't do well when the editorial assistant has that kind of an attitude. It was, it was, it was... So is that you're admitting to having an attitude? Oh, now? absolutely. It was, it was young man on the make, and... Okay. Has that changed, or...? I hope it's turned into experience. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I, what happened was um, I left, and as I left, I said, Oh, can I still review books? And Doris Cowan said, No, you're not good enough for me. And I went home, and literally the day, the next day, Jack of Pizza from the Globe and Mail phoned and said, Finally, I get in touch with you. Would you write for the Globe and Mail, please? And I thought, ah, well, I well, guess I'm got, good enough for the Globe. And you've I, got kind of a, a, like with these Governor General victories and the Globe calling you, this is really good fuck you material. Yes, in a memoir coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you um, do take the memoirs with the greatest thought. <laughs> but uh, um, so I reviewed for the Globe, and then I um, went to work at the world's biggest bookstore. Okay. And I had learned there that you know, keep your head down, keep your nose clean, and don't let the boss know you're smarter than he is. You learned that from experience. I learned that from experience, and the um, wonderful boss we I had at the world's biggest bookstore was a man named Ross Gorey, and he knew how to run a bookstore from the ground up. Everything. So what, was, what were his keys to success? Keys to success. Make sure the staff knows where everything is. Make sure the staff does their job. Which is what? Know your books. Know your like section. Read your books? Keep it. He didn't expect us to read the books, but he expected us to read the newspapers, mm. to read anything that would review a book, mm. to come in on a Saturday morning having read the Globe and Mail and known to put certain books at the front of the section or to have them moved to the cash registers, that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, I was in charge of a terrible section, philosophy, psychology, you know, sociology sells like crazy in used bookstores. In used bookstores, maybe. Not in the world's biggest bookstore. Okay. But one day I was home from work and Oprah Winfrey had Maya Angelou on. So I phoned the store and I said, take all of the Maya Angelou, put it on an end cap right now. And by the time I was at work 12 hours later, it was all gone. And I thought, mm -hmm. there's a really important lesson. The next thing I did there was I... Um, Sorry, that's just to pay attention to the media. Yeah, and when the media, when somebody like Oprah, and this is before the Oprah Book Club, right. says, you know, interviews Maya Angelou, you put the books there, people will come into the store and say, I just heard about you, I want to buy your book. You so, know, that reminds me of my grandfather, who in semi-retirement was a, was a doctor on a small channel in the Channel Islands. Oh. And... Uh, Lots of islanders used to subscribe to uh, the Reader's Digest, and he did too because whenever there was any mention of a kind of weird little disease, they all came into the office complaining <laughs> about it. Right. <laughs> anyway, so yes, uh, the public is successful. What other success? Yeah. What other success? Uh, well, keys to success. The other keys to the success were um, talking to the customers. Mm -hmm. He encouraged that, talked yeah. to the customers, and he used to have staff meetings once a week yeah. where we had to come and bring two books to talk about with other staff members, and one had to be a book you liked and a book that was doing well in your section. And so he, that everyone knew about what was exactly, in the store. Exactly, yeah. exactly. 
And um, hmm. he was just, he was a delight to work for. I got promoted and promoted within the store. And then he very kindly said to me, the next position that's open at head office of Kohl's, which owned World's Biggest, he said, is yours. And I said, great. And I thought, Towers of Bay and King. And I said, where is the head office? And he said, Rexdale. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear, <clears throat> I, I, I can't do that. Is that like Scarborough? Um, opposite direction, close to the airport. Okay. So I thought, I think I better find another job. Okay. Uh, and I applied to be a program assistant at the Ontario Arts Council. Yeah. And um, I was hired in 1989. Okay. And I was responsible for the writers' programs. There were four at the time. My position, the position that I ended up holding, had been held by three people in nine months. <laughs> so I got to clean up all of fiscal 1989-90 and start fiscal 1990-91. Um, and that was a, it was an interesting time. Um, the woman who hired me was uh, Margaret McClintock, who left one week later to go and run Coach House Press. And what, as the editor or publisher? As the publisher. Okay. There was, that left me and the associate officer, Susan Rutledge. And um, you learn a lot quickly. Margaret had suggested I read a few things like the Royal Commission. And I read it and I looked up from the it. The Royal Commission on the book, on the book publishing, publishing industry. Yeah, industry. Yeah. And um, I looked up and thought, why didn't we implement everything in this? But you learn a lot being in a granting office. So right. these were, sorry, this was, uh, this was basically... Writers applying for grants. Writers you, applying for grants. And you would evaluate. No, or no, the jury would evaluate. The jury's evaluated. Yeah, okay. yeah the jury's evaluated. No, I just saw, oversaw the process. Right. But you learn quickly. One of the things, I wasn't responsible for the block grants to publishers, Susan Rutledge was. Okay. But we communicated about things. And one day, when we came to the, when it was the end of the application period for the block grants, there was one company that had applied that didn't meet the basic eligibility criteria. They had only published three books, and the requirement was you had to publish four books a year. And they were called Sister Vision Press, books by, for, and about women of color. And Susan and I talked, and we agreed. Books by, for, and about women of color, they're never going to sell enough to be able to publish that fourth book. And the reason an arts council was created was to specifically ensure that presses like that could do their work. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those the cases... ones that wouldn't be viable without... Without yeah. government funding. Yeah. So we said, they're going to be in the program. We're just going to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And, you know, next year they applied, they published five books. Mm -hmm. And they did excellent, excellent, excellent work. And you learn quickly what it's really like out there for writers and publishers. Mm -hmm. Because you're looking at their applications. So what was it like? Depressing. Because what? Because there were a lot of really great writers who were still applying for grants. Mm -hmm. you, you, I, I would have thought by this point in their career they'd be selling sufficient books. Right. They weren't. And I mean, I don't want to name anybody because that's a confidential process. Yeah. But people who really should have been making a living from their writing. So do they have to show that they needed money? No, they don't have to show they need the money. Then what did what did what was the criteria? The the criteria is only excellence. That's it. You award excellence. That's, and that's all what it is. The jury, so it's very subjective. It's is excellence subjective? Damn right it is. Hmm. I'm going to disagree with you there. I think we all how can you quantify excellence. How you uh, well I mean, aside from awards, let's say, and a certain well, uh, award, it's, certain those are popularity. Those, those are all subjective too. But I'm going to say this: excellent writing, distinction of style, command of the language, relevance, uh, has the ability to make the reader care. Mm -hmm. There, the are, thing is, though, the reader is a whole bunch of individuals, a whole pile of individuals, and what makes me care doesn't make you care. No, but we can all agree that somebody has command of a language. Mm -hmm. um, we can all agree that something is relevant. You may not like what it has to say, but it might be relevant. It's relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, an honest person can say, 
this isn't my cup of tea, but it's good. but it's damn fine writing, or it's a damn fine book, and I can say that about dozens of books I've read. Okay. Um, so, and that's yeah. what juries are supposed to do. I don't want to get bogged down in this, but the the idea of a jury putting forth a criteria that everyone can have a look at. And that's what they base their decisions on. I think that's... It's the arts councils that put forward the criteria for the jurors to look at. The criteria of excellence is what they put forward? They put forward... There's a list of, you know, command of the language, da da da. It is broken down, or it used to be anyway. Right. And the jurors refer to that. Okay. Um, So, uh, what was really good about the time you were there that no longer exists? Anything? Well, it's something I get in trouble for, but I will point this out. At the time, the top grant, this is 1990. Yeah. The so top, that's like 30 years ago. 30 years ago. The top grant from the Ontario Arts Council was Works in Progress, and it was $20,000. Okay. My salary at the OAC was $27,000. Right. So you could sort of say, eh, there's some semblance. There's some, you know, 20. Today, the top grant you can get from the Ontario Arts Council is $12,000. When it really should, if you were going to follow inflation, it should be sorry, closer. The person to, in your position now is making fifty, dollars probably. Exactly. Yeah. And inflation would decree that you should be, that grant should now be 40000 It went down to twelve. Are they are, are they handing out the, the, these grants to the same number of people or more? Or I less? haven't been able to make a study of it. Okay. But what I can say is that after the Mike Harris years at the Ontario Arts Council, mm-hmm. all the monies that came in were not put into writing and publishing at the same rate that they were put into uh, other disciplines. And during the Mike Harris years, the writing and publishing section took greater hits than all the other sections. That's just statistical fact. And any explanation for that? Um, no. The Arts Council literally refuses to engage in that discussion. So someone in pol- at the political level... That's not political. That's within the... Bureaucracy. A, within the, 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 the bureaucracy of the Ontario Arts Council makes those decisions. Okay made those decisions. Right. I will say in the last five years, the disciplines have gone up more or less equally. Mm -hmm. But still, there is no compensation. As I said, how can you compare a $20,000 grant in 1990 to a $12,000 grant in 2020? Just, it's outrageous. So there was a lot of money around back then. We didn't think there was a lot back then. No. Clearly there was. Um, the executive director of the Ontario Arts Council at the time was a man named Norm, Norm Walford. And he was a delight to work for. Um, he was one of those people who ran a very steady ship and expected... He expected everybody to do well, and so people did. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a marvelous time. So what are you saying right now? you say saying that the... <laughs> The Ford government should bump these uh, grants up. Oh, no, no, the Ford government has nothing to do with it. This is the Ontario Arts Council no, itself. But the, I know, but the, the, they get funding from the Ford uh, administration. The problem is the OAC budget, starting with Dalton McGuinty, probably tripled oh. over the liberal period. The grants to writers did not go up accordingly. Okay. One of the concerns is that the Canada Council does, you know, they, they fund writers as well, right? Yes. We don't have any shortage of writers. Everyone's writing now. There's Almost. more people writing than reading. That, excellent observation. There are more people writing than reading and one of the problems with the creative writing schools, and this will get me in trouble with a lot of people, is good. Um, <laughs> they teach people how to do something that you should be able to do naturally. I personally believe writers are born, they're not made. All you can do is take a person with talent and help them hone their craft. Mm-hmm. How many of those are really in a creative writing class in any given year? And, and, and the creative writing classes don't require, there's a, a, it appears 
they don't require their students to read or read widely. And I have a problem with that. Read, all good writers are great readers. They are. All great writers are really great readers. Yeah. And they're voracious. They read as kids. They read, read as, teen, they read as teenagers. Mm -hmm. They read all their way through university. And they want to learn from what they read. Right? Exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's where they really learn. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so what? The, the university is a scam? No, well, that's, 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 that's unfair. I, I think it's at some point the universities thought, well, a lot of people want to take creative writing. That's how universities work these days, isn't let's, it? Let's offer the courses. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Wherever the demand is, we're going to put a course we'll, together. We'll put a course together. And, you know, God, when I was at McGill, I did take a creative writing course. And it was a senior level course. Mm -hmm. And you had to apply. Okay. You had to send in a portfolio. And you had to be interviewed by the professor. So I put in my portfolio. It was my first year at McGill, but it was a 400 level course. And I went to visit the professor, and the interview consisted of this. So, um, you wrote all these poems in the last year? Yes. I don't think this is the course for you. <laughs> I said, oh, please, please let me in, thinking this is the land that produced Leonard Cohen. I'm not good enough. Oh, dear God in heaven. And I, the professor and I had a long talk, and he let me in the class. At the end of the year... That all it was was your persuasive... Supposedly. Powers. At the end of the year, he had an exit interview. And he said to me, now do you understand what I meant? This wasn't the class for you? <laughs> and I said, yes, because there were three of us in the class who could actually write poetry. And there were a dozen people who were smart, mm -hmm. wonderful, and not particularly talented right. who couldn't. They were motivated, but... Motivated, but it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And the, the entire year was a conversation between three writers and the prof. And everybody else got to sit and watch. Mm -hmm. And I think that tells me a lot about creative writing classes mm -hmm. going forward. What about, uh, so the Canada Council, same sort of thing. They're spending, uh, they, and they've got a big increase thanks to yes. the, the Liberals, thanks yes. to Trudeau. Uh, this this goes for funding publishers as well, right? Yes. Or does it all go to the writers? No, it goes to everybody. So it's is it, it is publishers it and writers. Fifty fifty or? Oh God, I have no idea what the stats are. I don't, haven't don't know that. what the breakdown is. No, okay. um, and they also fund organizations. They fund reading series. So they they fund yeah. Harbor Front, Vancouver Writers Festival, okay. the Ottawa Water Writers Festival. Are you happy with what's going on? No. Okay. Why not? Thirty years ago. The imperative was award excellence. Mm -hmm. and, Very subjective. Um, and today it seems to be geared towards uh, production and size of company. So if you are a large company with big sales and you produce 100 titles a year, yeah. your Canada Council grant is going to be huge. So is your Ontario Arts Council grant. So you have to ask yourself, Hmm. The Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, and the biggest grants are going to McGill Queen's University Press, Tor University of Toronto Press. Are these really what we should be funding with arts money? You know, U of T gets one of the biggest or the biggest grant from the Ontario Arts Council for publishing. How much? A hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And. Not a whole hell of a lot, but... Three and a half times more than I get. They are an important press. I take nothing away from mm -hmm. them. But they are publishing scholarly books, not Art. trade books or, or poetry or fiction. Okay. Um, but their budget is such, and the way the funding now works, it's geared to your budget. I think that's problematic. Mm -hmm. And the reason they moved to this was, earlier you said... Well, awarding excellence, that's so subjective. And one of the arguments that has been made over the years by a number of my colleagues has been, fund us, we do the most books, we have big budgets. Well, to some of those colleagues I have to say, it takes a very fine talent to over 20 years produce 100 books, 100 titles a year, 
and never get on a major awards list. So it's quantity over quality. Over quality, and we should be funding quality over quantity. And so you're measuring quality by number of awards as one criteria? That's one criteria. I mean, you can look at a publishing company and say, publishing company X does very fine books. Publishing company Y does a lot of stuff that, well, isn't all that important. You can say that. But the, it seems that the arts, arts councils have become commerce councils, and they're funding, funding the commercial activity as opposed to the artistic activity. Which is, when I spoke with them, that's what they emphasized. This is to, this, we are here to promote artistic excellence. excellence. That's the line. And then look at the results they have. Their grants are geared to budgets. Shouldn't they be funding enterprises that are successful, that are producing books that people people want to read, but that challenge people as well, that are a little bit beyond the reader, perhaps? Um, that's a tricky one, okay? But I will say this. I think that if a company publishes first-time authors, there are three or four publishing companies in Canada that have a history of publishing people who go on to great careers. Mm. Okay? Like, Corm like who? Cormorant. Okay. Well, Nino Ricci, yeah. Elizabeth Hay, Joseph Boyden, Sheree <laughs> Demoline, um, you know, Zoe Whittle. There's a lot. There's a num quite a number. That's Cormorant, House of Anansi, uh, Coach House. Mm -hmm. These are presses that have what it takes editorially to spot talent and develop it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't always do the first books, but we take people with talent who maybe published one or two books that went nowhere, and we can turn them into something. And eventually they end up being published by Random House or HarperCollins. Because what? Just because of advances? Because their agents come along and say, we can get you a better deal. Which is what? A bigger percentage? No, it's never a bigger percentage. It's a bigger advance. Yeah, but the, and the advance, they, they get to keep the advance if they don't earn it. Right. That's the only benefit of That's the advance. That's the only benefit of the advance, yes. But back to your question originally about, we'll come back to advances if you want, but back to the funding of the publishers. So I think that funding a company that publishes, I'm going to say, you know, in our case, Cherie Demoline, or even Claws of the Panda, which we did earlier this year. Mm. These are important writers, important books. Yeah. Um, we should be funded, I would make a case, we should be funded more than companies that publish Canadian trivia books, or mm. Ghost Towns of Alberta, or but not the, that there's but, anything wrong with those books. So a seriousness, yes. uh, artistic merit. Yeah, yeah. cultural contributions. Yeah. So are you saying that these trivia books get the same funding you do? Unfortunately, yes. And why is that? You'd have to talk to the arts councils and the officers administrating the programs. Do you think it takes courage to say what you're saying right now because they might screw you next time around? Or There's not? no might about it. They do. So they... now you're really screwed. Yes, now I'm really screwed. But I've been screwed already. So um, the reality is the arts councils have done some very bad things. You and I will probably be talking later on about McClellan and Stewart. And they don't like it when, the, when they're caught. Mm. And instead of doing what an honorable person does, throw up your hands and say, okay, yes, did a bad one, they do things like withhold your funding. So, in other words, it's, it's not kind of a transparent administration of, uh, of, uh, of funds. Is that what oh. you're saying? It's transparent that they, u that they use their power as funders as retribution for people pointing out their duplicitiveness. Okay, duplicitiveness. so they would be what? The head of the Canada Council? Uh, I would say um, the head of the writing and publishing section, the head of the block grant program. Now, this is going back several years. And the uh, CEO of the Canada Council for the Arts himself. Just to... Uh... One other interesting area that's just sort of come to my attention is the fact that they're no longer funding or classifying as eligible for a Governor General's Award straight nonfiction. 
It's just memoirs now. You heard of that? I haven't heard of this. When did this happen? Uh, apparently, quite recently. Well, two years ago, they gave the GG for for nonfiction to a straight up nonfiction book that was bordering on the scholarly. Maybe I'm wrong. Then. I haven't heard this. I just heard it's, it recently. It's possible. I'd have to go back and look. But if that's the case, I don't know about it, and we've submitted books we shouldn't have. Because uh, apparently, yeah, the criteria is that it can't be sort that of makes journalistic. No sense. Non- it doesn't make any it sense. It doesn't make any sense because uh, that rules out essays, that rules out biographies, that rules out opinion books. Mm-hmm. History books. History books. Can, you, can, you can write a beautifully written history book that mm-hmm. has literary merit. Exactly. As I said, the councils have gone, particularly the Canada Council has run amok. It's run amok. The board does not do its job, and nobody is willing to rein in the staff. It's interesting that the, uh, I was in there interviewing a couple of the staff uh, members, and <laughs> about three weeks after I was in there, the, 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 the head person had resigned or left. I don't know. Uh, what I can say is, several years ago, I pointed out that they had overfunded McClellan and Stewart. Okay. And they argued with me. Thank God they did it in email. And when I ha- showed showed them the actual physical forms, because I'd done a freedom of information request, their response was to freeze my funding. And what country do we live in? Well, we clearly live in a country where people like the Canada, the people like the people who run the Canada Council get away with doing this. And if you write to the Canada Council to complain, their public relations department handles the problem and says, we did nothing wrong. And it's connect the dots. Obvious. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. Thanks. <laughs> it's too scary. Do you get funded by the Canada Council? No, not at all. I can show it all to you if you want. It's an embarrassment. Uh, literally, I was told, no, you're wrong. I sent the, I scanned the forms and sent them to them, mm-hmm. and they ignored the emails for months. And when I said, are you going to answer this? One person wrote back and said, well, we're not going to fund this anymore. And then when my grant came up, I was told, well, we're withholding the grants until you meet next year's requirements. I said, you can't do that. Argued with them. They gave me 50% and then said I couldn't apply the following year. Good, no wonder you're pissed off. Well, it's what, illegal. And when was that? 2015. So what's happened since? The company's been very lucky. What's that mean? We're self-funding at the moment. Okay. Our sales are good enough and the tax credits are good enough. And the Ontario Arts Council, low as it is, has been helpful enough. But the sales have driven us. Congratulations. Thank you, Marrow Thieves. Do you get any uh, part of the film action yes, we do on get, that? Yes, we do. Excellent. Let's move on to the uh, Literary Press Group. What's that? Literary Press Group was an association, is still an association of 40 or so uh, small independent literary publishers. And when I say small, uh, revenues of under $2 million a year. Um, it has to be that small, or are they just... That they just are. Yeah. Um, it's the people who publish poetry and fiction. Sure. Companies like Cormorant, or... Yeah. And um, from across Canada. And um, at the time, they were... 15 of them had national distribution through University of Toronto Press. Uh, two, I think, had worked out their own distribution agreements with University of Toronto Press. Yeah. And then about 30 had no distribution whatsoever. They were self-distributed. That was a problem. We had a sales force of three people who worked 12 weeks a year. And these are the people who go into the bookstores and try and sell books to the bookstores. This is back when the seasons, right? Based on the seasonal system, uh, spring and fall. And um, this is back when we had roughly 2,000 bookstores before the advent of chapters and high rents. And... um, I, I got the job, and it had been run by a very involved board. The board stayed involved. Uh, the previous executive director had worked very hard, 
and it was an organization that had been moved to the launching pad. And all I had to do was figure out what the fuel was and light the fuse. And um, I was really lucky. The grants fell into place very easily. We changed our distribution so that all members could be distributed by what was then General Publishing. It became General Distribution Services. So they had national, many publishers had national distribution for the first time. So this was what, kind of like a warehousing operation that shipped books to the bookstores? Yes, right. General Publishing yeah. did that. Yeah. And um, we created newsletters that went out to libraries and booksellers telling them about, this is back in the days of print, mm. long before email, and we did a whole pile of activities. Basically just marketing. Marketing, different... marketing, organizing advertising. We had advertising in Saturday night, in the Globe and Mail, all over the place. Kind of co-op advertising? Co-op advertising. Yeah. The government paid about 50%. The publishers paid 50%. And because we were buying in bulk, serious bulk, we got really deep discounts. Mm. Um, mm. And, you know, one of the things that happened was the Globe and Mail literally was able to afford to review more of our books, more of our authors. But we're assuming that there, there isn't a wall between advertising and editorial, but... In other words, what? They, they said, they had okay, more you spend this, we'll review this? Nobody said that. No. No. What, but what, what happened. happened was you spend more money, they can afford more space. Okay. More space goes to a broader yep. range. Yep. We ended up doing the marketing for the Governor General's Literary Awards at the Literary Press Group. We did all sorts of nuts and bolts stuff. and Like what? The, the distribution, sales. Sure. Our sales staff went from three working 12 weeks a year to four people working 52 weeks a year. Okay. Uh, and the sales went up. Our sales went from, I think we had sales of $72,000 a year when I started, and we just hit a million when I left five years later. That's a growth that's worthy of bragging about. Well, it was always there. The potential was always there. The books are that good. Right. Always were, always will be. These are, these are poetry books that, you know, Brick Books couldn't really get its books across the country in an effective way in 1991, but by 1994 it could. And so its sales went up accordingly. But as well, authors who wouldn't think necessarily of going to publish with the literary press were publishing with literary presses. And the editorial quality has always been there. So if, well, all we did was provide a, a mechanism for that to reach the booksellers and eventually the public. That That's interesting because right now I've read reports that say that fewer Canadians are reading fewer Canadian books than ever. And I think that was something called More Canada. It was a report. The Jim Lorimer report. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Those are facts. Back then, though, you were having a lot of success. The Literary Press Group was having a lot of success, and Canadian publishers in general were having a lot of success. This is the period when John Irving famously said, Oh my God, I look at the bestseller list on the Globe and Mail, and you have books I want to read on your bestseller list. When I look at the bestseller list of the New York Times, yeah. it's all books I wouldn't want to read. And he thought then that Canada was an impressive country with a true literary culture because all of our publishers were doing gangbusters and the foreign-owned companies were doing well with their Canadian authors. What year was that? Its apex would probably be 1996. Okay. So the year after I left the Literary Press Group. And then it, it, from there, it started to go downhill. After you... No, no, no. It had nothing. No, no. I'm talking about all publishers in Canada, Canadian authored books. Okay, why did it go downhill? A combination of factors. The super when when chapters was set up, they bought a lot of books from a lot of publishers, mm -hmm. and that was the beautiful wallpaper that made those great stacks of books. But the only books that really moved were the front books on the front shelves. It was also um, at the time that discounting was became regular practice. 
If Plus, they put, out, they put a lot of smaller independents out of business, or not? No. 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 I don't think that that can be said of chapters. Okay. They put general publishing out of business. Right. But they did not... Because they set up their own distribution. No, it had nothing Pegasus. to do with that. Pegasus was a disaster. It didn't work. No, they put, a, they put general publishing out of, distribution, out of business by shipping back, I think it was, 20 tractor trailers in yeah. one month. And that was an unheard of, unprecedented moment. Nobody could have coped with that. But what happened was books started to be discounted. And the only books that could be seriously discounted were the books coming from the major publishers. So what happens then is you you have John Grisham, James Patterson, and company moved forward, and everything gets moved back. And at the same time, we went from 2,000 bookstores in the country to 500. That's what I'm saying. But you're not blaming the books, that on chapters. No, bookstores? Yes, bookstores. No, you said, well, I thought you said publishers. No, bookstores. Oh, bookstores, yes. No, chapters definitely put bookstores out of business. Yeah, okay. Chapters, no argument, that was their model. They, they came and made a presentation to the Association of Canadian Publishers in which they explained, we want the lion's share of the market share. Mm-hmm. That's it. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, the Canadian, many people in the Association of Canadian Publishers thought they meant they were going to expand the book market itself. Right. Unfortunately, some of those people weren't very good at reading pie charts. Okay. Or tea leaves. Or, no, it was pie charts. Okay. Larry Stevenson was completely upfront with what he intended to do. No mistake about it. Okay. He was not duplicitous. And it worked. But so what happened, just, just as an interesting example, mm. in 1994... A small press from the prairies could produce a first novel that was truly brilliant and the sales force could convince maybe a thousand bookstores to take one or two copies. That's one or two thousand books. And they could convince the booksellers, you know, hey, in January when it's cold, no one's coming in your store, read this book. And then the book would sell. We can't do that anymore because we don't have those thousand bookstores to do that with and because rents have gone up and mm-hmm. book prices have stayed quite static they are literally half of what they should be according to inflation the chapters isn't, isn't taking the uh, uh, the fact that there's only 500 bookstores doesn't mean that chapters is taking oh. all the books that would have gone to those 1500 no no they're by taking any by any means no 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 they're not their their coverage is not that good Mm -hmm. and again that has to do with a whole pile of factors and you know the wonkiness of of a bookseller uh, I I shouldn't use the word wonkiness but there's a bookseller and every publisher has a similar story to the one I'm about to tell several years ago we published a book Great Village by Mary Rose Donnelly it won the Atlantic Book Prize the people the women who run a novel spot in Etobicoke fell in love with that book that store has sold more than 400 copies of that one book because they love it and they communicate that to their customers. Mm -hmm. And their customers come in and say, what else can you recommend to us? That doesn't happen in large stores. They don't have that kind of customer relations. And if they're going to back a book, they're going to say, buy Testaments, buy the Testaments by Margaret Atwood Mm -hmm. because they're going to back the Surefire book as opposed to something that they individually like. And it's interesting, over the years, different booksellers have sold large numbers of specific books because they fell in love with Mm. that title. And every publisher has those stories. Mm. It's too bad that that all the booksellers don't fall in love with your book. But it's just, it's patchwork, I guess. It's patchwork. And, you know, there are, what, a hundred Canadian publishers or more? There are Mm. way more than a hundred, but We'll just say a hundred. We're all trying to do the same thing. So <clears throat> we move on then to Stothard Publishing. Yes. Could you give me a little thumbnail of uh, the history of that company, if that's possible? Uh, Stothard Publishing was an imprint of General Publishing Company. Connected to the distribution? Yes. Okay. General Publishing was an agent for Simon & Schuster. Hodder and Stoughton, Hodder Headline, Dorling Kindersley, 
a number of international lines. They sold those books here in Canada to bookstores, libraries, etc. And um, Jack Stoddard Jr. Uh, set up Stoddard Publishing, the imprint, and he began to publish his own books. And he died not that long he ago. He died in January of this year. I think the very first book they did was The Rainmaker by Keith Davey. It set down a pattern of doing serious nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So over the years they published David Suzuki, a number of very important nonfiction books. Mm -hmm. They did The Wealthy Bar they took over The Wealthy oh, Barber. Which is, is that the top all time Canadian seller? No. It's not? Okay. No. Okay, what is, do you know? A certain Robert Munch book is. Is it? Okay. Yes. Um, it's, it's way up there. I, I think I Will Always Love You is, is number one, and uh, Wealthy Barber is number two. But, you know, and the rest of us could retire on the proceeds from those books. And Stoddard, over the years, they, they um, Jack Stoddard helped establish McFarland, Walter, and Ross. He bankrolled the comp that, comp that imprint, and they gave us Boom Bust and Echo, On the Take, a number of very important books. And he saved Anansi from oblivion, because when Anansi was about to disappear, yeah. he bought it when nobody else in the country would. He kept it going and then put it on its legs, and it was really? under, under his ownership that it got going again properly. When um, was that? Uh, he bought it in 85 or 86? Of course, in 2002, it was sold to Scott Griffin as part of the bankruptcy. Uh, so I went to work there in 1995 as the marketing manager. I was responsible for the fall titles and the upcoming spring titles. And the fall titles included Yankee Doodle Dandy by Marcy McDonald, which is a great book. And for reasons no one will ever understand, it did not sell particularly well. And we all thought it was going to be a blockbuster, and it deserved to be. It was her analysis of um, the Mulroney years. It wasn't the I got you of on the take. Right. It really was this Stevie very, Cannon, yeah. it was, you know, God bless Stevie for that work. Marcy McDonald's book was very thoughtful, beautifully written, and it was a really good analysis of what was really going on. And Never heard of it. Yeah. And it wasn't for lack of media. She was everywhere that we could get her. And, you know, sometimes books have bad karma. Mm -hmm. Nothing you could do. And the other big book of that fall was um, The Unconscious Civilization. John Ralston Saul. Mm -hmm. It was the Massey Lecture from uh, House of Nancy. And That's right. That's because he owned Anne Nancy at that point. Yes, yeah, yeah he owned Anne Nancy, so that yeah. was yeah. Okay. under my purview. And yeah. um, God, just tons and tons and tons of nonfiction books. Sure. That's, that was his strength. <laughs> that was the absolute strength. Right. Um, and what about funding from government? The, the, they, fund, they funded the nonfiction back then? The, uh, the Canada Council did not fund most of the serious nonfiction back then, right. but uh, it was funded through Bippy Dip. Through what? What was then called Bippy Dip, the Book Publishing Industry Development Program, which is now Canadian Heritage Canada Book Fund. Every government has to rebrand the programs. And it was a very dynamic place. I mean, one of the things that I learned very quickly, if a book wasn't selling to Jack's expectations, there were meetings. One time we were in a meeting and he was disappointed with with Yankee Doodle Dandy not moving. Is it the title, do you think? Who knows? Well, I said, at the time, I said, I think it's got the wrong jacket. And he said, what? And I said, the cover's completely wrong. Well, within an hour, Angel Guerra had come up with a new cover. And within two days, 10,000 new jackets were printed, sent to the reps, wow. and the reps were sent into the stores to re-jacket the books on the shelves. So you had an impact uh, then. I did. And that, 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 that must have made you feel good that he would be that responsive. He was, he was very, very good to work for. Yeah. He was um, really dedicated to having a book publishing company that was relevant to the people of the country. And it mattered deeply. Do you think he's being recognized adequately? No. Not at all. I mean, he got the Order of Canada. He was made an officer of the Order of Canada. Mm -hmm. Well earned. I don't think he's been adequately recognized, but I will also say that there are a number of public, similar publishers of his generation, Scott McIntyre and Anna Porter, their genius is still not properly recognized. 
they had amazing publishing companies and they published stuff so important and like what okay scott mcintyre was publishing books about indigenous people mm. long before it was a beautiful mission. book too right extraordinarily like, beautiful uh, books and f- photography and photography art, art um but also books by indigenous people yeah. he did two amazing books by robert bringhurst who translated um legends yeah this is important stuff mm-hmm. really why is it important because that culture was suddenly made available to thousands of people across the country. Those legends were suddenly available for people to read and understand. Jack Stoddard, political books, political books, David Suzuki. Um, he also did a lot of indigenous writers that people don't know about because the books didn't do particularly well back then. Anna Porter had a wide range of things, but again, extraordinarily important political books. Mm. But, you know, probably the most famous one of all. And I don't know the story, but she was the person who got Jean Chrétien to write Straight from the Heart. Mm, huge bestseller. And not only a huge bestseller, it took somebody who had lost the leadership, the challenge for the leadership, to John Turner and was in the political wilderness. Mm. And it put him back not only at the center of the party, it mm. made him leader. You think? Oh, I know. I mean, it maintained his popularity, for it sure. increased his popularity. Yeah. And people suddenly felt they knew who he was, they knew what it was all about, and yeah. they wanted him to be their well, prime minister. It, he went on a, a barnstorming tour of the country. And, yeah. yeah. Which you can do when you have a great book. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Anna Porter. Lots of buzz. Lots of buzz. So a, a, a publisher having an impact on politics, big time. Big time. And Anna did a lot of those kinds of books. Mm. And, you know, she did... The first Heart Smart cookbook. Yeah. And at this point, it would be like, what, 35 years ago? James Lorimer did a number of really, really important books going back a number of years. But, you know, he did the first Elizabeth so Baird. Are you talking cookbook. about a new publisher here? No, James Lorimer and Company. Right. They've been around since the early 70s. Mm, yes, but not Stoddard. No, no, not Stoddard. Where, no. where uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. You're giving that a just, little overview here. Right? Yes, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was, these are all contemporaries. Yeah. And okay. these people did. They really worked hard at establishing a Canadian publishing industry. Right. So I'm sorry I got sidetracked. So back to Stoddard then. Uh, he's important because of... The publishing program. The political books primarily, you yes, say? Yes, I would say, yes. And what were the dates of that company? 1985 to 2002. And why did it go bankrupt? Because of gen- the general side? Yes, yeah. Because chapters... Yeah. Prior to its being taken over by Indigo, returned 20 tractor trailers of right. returns. And that really hit a bunch of Canadian and independent publishers. It, it hit everybody. It just explain that. How did it hit them? Okay. Books are sold on a returnable basis. Mm-hmm. They are returnable for full credit. So Larry Stevenson wanted to sell chapters. He wanted to get out. And he needed to clean up his balance sheet. So he returned 20 tractor trailers full of books to just general distribution services. Now, this included Douglas McIntyre, Key Porter Books, Stoddard Publishing, and a number of Porcupine's Quill, Cormorant Books, Talon Books, everybody. Those books, and this is, this has never been in print before, those books went into the warehouse and the warehouse manager did not process them. So what happens is... Wait a second, can you, which warehouse manager? The warehouse manager at General Publishing, General Distribution Services. Okay. So they take in, and this is what it actually said on the report, an estimated $13, $13 million worth of books, which they did not process. So, one... Chapters, when it gets its bill from General Distribution Services for $8 million, says, well, you owe us $20, you owe us $20 million, so now you owe us $12 million. So Chapters wasn't paying General Distribution Services. And in the meantime, because the returns weren't re- properly processed, General Distribution Services was on the hook to pay 
the publishers for books that had already been returned but not accounted for. And Jack took a gamble based on very bad advice from his warehouse manager and his head of administration. And the gamble was the government would provide sufficient funding to general distribution services and general publishing to keep it going while all of this got sorted out. And how did he know that? It was a gamble. Right. It was a gamble based on the belief that people working for him had access to Sheila Copps, that people working for him were going to sort out the problem. And neither was true. And he wrote checks for books for, to publishers that he didn't have the money to pay for, and the warehouse never got cleaned up properly. So eventually it all catches up, and uh, accounts payable exceeded accounts receivable. And Scotiabank brought in the um, uh, an accounting firm, in this case, Deloitte Touche, and um, they came in, and they literally did not know how to run a publishing company, and they didn't know what to do. So from receivership to bankruptcy was a very short walk, and it was an unpleasant situation. And I ended up being one of the inspectors in the bankruptcy, and Scotiabank informed us on the first day, our first meeting, that everything was to be, dis was to be confidential and we were not to share information. And I said, well, isn't that funny? The government f flyer that I got, so now you're an inspector in a bankruptcy, says I'm actually required to share this information with my fellow creditors. And the vice president at Scotiabank said, well then, this will be a very short and closed bankruptcy. Talk to you at the end. And I said, you can't do that. And he said, sue us. And may I remind you, Scotiabank has a fuck of a lot more money than you do. So at the end of the day, the estimated $13 million worth of books turned out to be $20 million worth of books, about 13 of which was owed. I forget how it all works out. But in the end, Chapters slash Indigo owed the estate of General Publishing about $13 million. And they were returning the books, though. Yes, they, this, no, Chapters had returned the books, but when all of everything got sorted out, because in those returns, those massive returns, an enormous portion was not general publishing product. Skids of books published by other companies, like right. HarperCollins or Random House, simply returned to GP. Because they were the distributor. That's what they no, were. they weren't the distributor. So why were they sent there then? Because it was a returns frenzy, and the people at Chapters, this is before Indigo, people at Chapters just returned everything they could. Because they, they were told to the, clean it out. They were told to clean out. And General Publishing, on their end, General Distribution Services, did not process the returns properly. So, so they said they didn't say, this is ours, that's not ours, you can't... That's right. You can't ship, but they, what, they ended up on their doorstep? They ended up on their doorstep. So they, they should have said, this isn't ours, Take send it back. that back. Send that skid of Jonathan France and the Corrections back to HarperCollins where it came from. Right. Or back to Chapters? Well, yeah, back to Chapters, to send back to HarperCollins. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, at the end of the day, it was not a very good bankruptcy. What does that mean? Well, it means that if, if Indigo had been forced to pay the money it owed to the estate, and if instead it was that loan, that, that debt was forgiven, uh, if the, uh, the parts of the general publishing empire had been sold off for profit, everybody would have got their money out. Because that was the other thing. The claims made by most publishers were based on their lack of knowledge. So people thought they were owed $100,000, mm. but when the returns were finally accounted for, they were owed $4,000. Or in That's some right. cases... Because, because they had to accept their own product back. Right, right. And in some cases, some of the publishers actually ended up owing general distribution services money. How did that work? because their returns exceeded their sales. 
you can't have more books returned than you sell. Yes, you can. How because you sold the books last year and you sell them this year. So you last year's returns can exceed this year's sales. And they did in some cases. Okay. So if that had been a properly run bankruptcy or a receivership, Stoddard Publishing and General Publishing would still be here today. In a reduced form, but they would still be here today. And the primary reason for this was, as you say, the fact that the people at the warehouse just didn't process things correctly. That's right. The, the, the biggest faults were the returns by chapters under Larry Stevenson yeah. and the failure of the warehouse to, re, to process the returns in a timely manner. And That's where it falls apart. And a lot of published, small publishers were harmed by this. Everybody was harmed. Key Porter was... The horrible thing is... <clears throat> they, they, would, did they go bankrupt? No, they didn't go bankrupt no. right away. No. But they took enormous hits. Right. What's enormous? Was that how much? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. And it destabilizes them. Yeah. And it destabilized Douglas and McIntyre. And these companies all ended up either falling apart or closing their doors or being sold to somebody who closed them, their doors as well. And the federal government just walked away from this, or what? Federal government made loans. Usually in a case like that, after two years, the federal government would say, we'll forgive the loans. And the federal government did not forgive the loans. And the Association of Canadian Publishers had a motion, unanimously supported, to ask the government to forgive the loans. And the president of the organization never wrote the letter. Asking the government to do this. That's right. Why is that? In his words, I wasn't in that warehouse. Doesn't matter to me. So his company wasn't harmed. His so company he, wasn't harmed. Yeah, but that's he's he's the head of the organization that represents everyone. He was the president, yes. Do you want to name him or Kirk not? Howard, Dundurn Press. You worked for them? Yes. I had worked for them. Prior to this? Uh yes. Why do you think he did that? Just because it wasn't his skin off his nose? Because I think he thought it would cause harm to other people and it wouldn't cause harm to him. Brass knuckles business. Wait a minute. It didn't hurt him, but it would hurt others and yes. that's good for him. Yeah. That's not too collegial. No, it's not. I thought, I thought the Canadian publishing industry was... Collegial? Yeah. It might have been prior to 1996. So it's still like that? I don't know. I don't belong to the ACP anymore. The problem was, beginning in 1986, 1996 is when things start to go wrong. Up until then, the funding through the federal government, the Department of Canadian Heritage, the funding was based on Canadian authorship. And when the president of, oh God, what's the name of the publishing company? They're based in Peterborough. Um, oh, yeah. Broadview. Broadview. Broadview Press. When he became president of the ACP, he lobbied for the government to fund publishers based on sales only because Broadview Press did Canadian editions of Jane Austen, which ended up, and the lobbying won. So again, this is a quantity over quality. This is quantity over quality, and even quantity over Canadian authorship, like, right. you know, the, what should be the sine qua non of... The, the funding. Oh, all funding policy. Yeah. He lobbied against it. One, because he was the president of the ACP. And so the federal government started funding companies based on the sales of Maeve Binchy and Harry Potter and other non-Canadian authors. And they did this from... Just because Canadian publishing houses were reprinting them or... Or held the licenses to publish them here right. in Canada. Right. Or, di or distribute it was based on, I don't know if it was distribution. I mean, in the case of Harry Potter and Maeve Binchy, they were published here. Right, right. They didn't originate here, but they were published here. They were publishing licenses. So Raincoast must have got a shitload of grants then. You bet. In addition to the huge sales they received. You bet. And that stopped when I complained. 
but the government wouldn't do it. Like, why are they just listening to this guy at Broadview? Like, what? Like he was the president of the yeah, association. It's a big deal. They just what, they spoke to the industry and they thought this is what everyone wanted. Well, he speaks for the industry, right? Well, he speaks for himself, I guess, or well, a portion of the industry. That he is supposed to speak for the entire association. Right, right. That's why you're no longer a part of it. Well, I was for a while afterwards, but once once Kirk Howard informed me that he wasn't a, he his books weren't in the general warehouse and he didn't have to write such a letter, I. Uh, thought, I think I don't want to be part of this anymore. Well, that's quite a lot to take in there, uh, Mark. Yeah. So, not very collegial. By the way, the funding now is based on Canadian authorship. When did that change? Uh, it changed in 2002, when Wendy Lill rose in Parliament during question period and asked Sheila Copps why she was funding publishers for publishing Harry Potter. <laughs> and Sheila Copps went back and screamed at the <laughs> bureaucrats, and it was changed immediately. Right. <laughs> and, you know, this is all through the same period when Avi Bennett sold m and to Random House. Right. And, of note, serious note, prior to that, m and never had a member on the board of directors of the ACP. From that moment on, there was always a member of m and on the board of the ACP. And the ACP never thought that obviously wrong deal. Mm. The, the obviously wrong deal that funded... Well, that, that allowed Abby Bennett to sell a Canadian company to a foreign-owned... Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. That was against the law, that was against policy, that was against everything. Yeah. And that then allowed Random House to collect $70 million or more of public funding. Yeah. And Elaine Dewar does a very good job of describing that. Yes, she does. And listeners can reference my conversation with her for yeah. more details. Yes. Uh, okay. A book, by the way, that was nominated for the Governor General's Literary Award, which, if what you say is true, and mem only memoirs are eligible now, would no longer be nominated. Exactly. And a book that should have been nominated deserved it. it. It was, wasn't it? Or it was, yes it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But no longer would be eligible if what you Based told me is true. Based on what I've heard. Okay, so anything else about Stothard? Um, any, any, anything collectible? Collectible. From what, what they put out? I guess what I mean is outstandingly beautiful books that they produced. Photographs by Yosef Karsh. Wow, I'd have to go upstairs and go through my library. But yes, they, they certainly put out book some book. extraordinary books. So, uh, does that take us to Cormorant yet? No, we... no, that takes us to 1996. I left Stoddard. I was only the marketing manager for August, September, October, November, December, January. And then I left. Mm -hmm. And you're going to say, why was I there for such a short period of time? And what was my next job? I was there for such a short period of time because... It was a difficult place to work. I thought you loved uh, this, daughter. I loved working for Jack, and I certainly admired some of my colleagues, one of whom still works with me today at Cormorant, exactly. uh, Angel Guerra, who is our, our cover designer and is uh, somebody I rely on for ideas and thoughts, and I talk to him seriously every day. But it was a difficult company because... I went from being the person in charge of a staff of 10 to a member of a staff of 70 or 80 people yeah. where everybody was jockeying for position. I think it was the... That's a big company. It's a, it, was a lar it was a very large company. Yeah. It was the largest Canadian distributor. It was one of the largest publishers. But one morning I walked into my office at 8 o'clock and my colleague from sales was measuring my desk. It was brand new. It had been ordered for me. <laughs> Literally? Literally measuring my desk. <laughs> and I said, don't tell me mine is bigger than yours. And he said, yes, and you have two windows in your office and I only have one. That kind of thing is really hard to work with. Uh, the previous person who'd been, who'd been the vice president of marketing and sales handed me the marketing manual for the fall titles. And when I opened it up, it was blank sheets. That kind of thing went on. And I, I just couldn't fathom 
working you needed all to of that. have your own company is what you needed um yes we discovered that later on the other thing i needed was just for it to have been a smoother transition and you know one of my colleagues said to me a few months ago after jack died do you think everything would have been different if you'd stayed and anna porter very kindly said that way lies madness but uh i i i maybe should have stayed and worked through it instead of saying Ugh. so i left well that's the one of the worst things about working in an organization is office politics office politics and if yeah. you can if it's if it's toxic and it was you can't fix that easily no. unless you're the boss and it was going to take a while to fix it okay um, so and where did we go well i went nowhere i quit I took time off and i thought Finally, I can go you back. You went on a trip around the world. No, I thought, I'm going to be a writer. That's what I moved to Toronto. Remember, I was going to be a playwright. I was oh, under yeah. contract with Canadians. I, I will go back, and I will start to write. Right. And um, so I sat down, and I thought, well, the first... You're going to be poor. <laughs> well, I, I, hopefully not. I was. Playwrights can do okay in this country. They can do okay if their plays are produced. Okay. Um, so I thought... What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm read. To do that, but. I'm going to read all of Proust. That'll be cleanse my mind, and then I'll start writing. And um, within how long did that take? Oh, I didn't make it all the way through. I think I made it into volume three. And, I just went through Swan's Way. That's about as far as I got. And you know, I would have kept reading, except the Canada Council called, and they said. How would you like to run the Governor General's Literary Awards? Wait a second. So, 1996. Were they off with you at that point? No, 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 no. That's they recent. Weren't? That's recent. Oh, okay. No, no. At this okay. point, I'm the golden child I see. for them. Okay. No, 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 no. Um, would I like to run the Governor General's Literary Awards? 1996. Well, that's a nice call. So, I, um, I went up to Ottawa uh, and was interviewed by the woman who became my boss, Carol Bream, and... Carol Bream? Bream. B-R-E-A-M. Has she written books about this? No. Nothing. No, not yet. I'm thinking of Crean. That's who That's Susan Crean. Yeah. Yeah. Carol Bream, no. Um, She, anyway, she interviewed me, and I was surprised about the interview, and then she went away and came back and said, well, here's the contract, read it over, sign it, and you start tomorrow. (laughs) That's pretty fast for government. It was very fast. Well, it was a contract position. It was to work, to coordinate the GGs, not the juries. The decisions are being made, marketing. but it's all the marketing and all the moving pieces. That's fun. And it was. Yeah. And what an enormous amount of work. So I collect our McDonald's award winners, so who, who won that year? That year, um, the nonfiction winner was Unconscious Civilization by John Ralston Saul. Okay. Fiction was The Englishman's Boy by Guy Vanderhey. A post- You trying to remember poetry? The poetry was uh, D.G. Blodgett. I forget what the book was. The play was called The Soldier. So you just did that for a year? Uh, en anglais et français. No, I did that through through the awards. Right. And then cleaned it all up. And at the end of it all, I had to pull together the budget. And it what came, do you mean? Well, because up until then... The council had hived off parts expenses for the GGs in different places into different budgets, and it was my responsibility and Carol's to bring it all under one budget. So after we did all of that, they discovered that it was costing the council a million dollars almost to do the entire GGs from start to finish. Including the awards. The award monies themselves, the ceremony, etc. And um, one of the big ticket items was the dinner. Uh, for which the one of the sponsors got a hundred thousand dollar charitable tax receipt, uh, a dinner which could not have cost more than ten thousand dollars. So my my big contribution that year was to s- say, hmm, instead of having a dinner at the headquarters of the Bank of Montreal in Montreal, what if we had a state banquet at Rideau Hall? Well, that's where, that's where the, all the ceremony takes place. Nope, there was no cere- nothing to do with Rideau Hall back then. No, the ceremony was a staged event 
either in Montreal or Toronto. And then the dinner was either bank headquarters in Montreal or the 56th floor of BMO Tower here. I called up Rito Hall and said, how much would a state dinner for 250 people cost? And my colleague at the at Rito Hall said, oh, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000? And I said, you're kidding. And he said, no, there's no tax. I said, would you people be willing to hold a state banquet for the winners of the GG and the, the, maybe even the nominees? And, the, and uh, he said, get the council to write a letter to the governor general. So I wrote up this wonderful letter, all done in fancy style. Back in those days, you, it was printed out on vellum. It would be put in a binder between pieces of velvet. Was this? And Yes. And then the letter would go to, at that time, the director of council was Monsieur Cavier, and he would sign it, and then it would be put, put in a special envelope and sent over to Rideau Hall. So I write up the letter, it gets printed on the vellum, and it comes back to me, with a line through it. What a waste of vellum. And, and Monsieur Carrier had written, No, no, no. On ne dit pas, um, cher gouverneur général, on dit cher ro. <laughs> so, we rewrote the letter, <laughs> and it went over, and um, the governor general called Monsieur Carrier and said, Of course we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And hence, everything was moved into Rideau Hall. And I think everybody's quite happy with that. It's a uh, wonderful pomp and ceremony. Great pomp and ceremony yeah. and great, great, uh, great event. Okay. Um, and it's got a nice feel to it. Sure, yeah. Uh, appropriate. Yeah, it is appropriate. Yeah. It really is. And it's a moving ceremony. And it's nice to see, you know, members of the Supreme Court attending it. It, uh, it, it gives it weight. And the Canada Council, after that, also moved the laureates and their publishers are invited to commons. Yes, where and, they where they're and a, procl a proclamation is yes. read out, and they are yeah. they are. Um, it's 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 mm. really wonderful. It gives yeah. you a sense that the literature of this country matters and it's and, being recognized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, beautiful things. So I worked there at the council, and mm. at the end of that, that con that's a significant uh, change you brought about. That, that's, well, I was only responsible unusual. for I was only responsible for moving it into Rideau Hall. Yeah, but still, that's something. Um, and uh, but at the end of my contract, my boss very kindly said, why don't you just come back and you can be the senior officer responsible for all prizes. Okay. So I went back and I was senior officer responsible for all prizes, which meant rewriting all the prize descriptions and looking up their histories and having to phone people and say, hi, I'm happy to tell you that you've just won the Japan Canada Book Prize. And... It's, it's the great job at the council. It really mm -hmm. was. Yeah. And, um, How long did you do that for? Uh, all of four months. The federal government cut the Canada Council budget significantly. And, well, it's true. Last hired is first fired. So out the door went a whole swath of... I wasn't let go in the first okay. swath. I was let go in the second swath. So back um, to the playwriting then. Back to playwriting. I come back to Toronto. Did, did you actually produce a play or not? Outside of university, no. Okay. So I came back, and um, within days, Kirk Howard called me and said, when I come and talk to him, I went and talked to him, and he said, please help me figure out how to reorient Dunder and Press. Is this, this is prior to... The souring of the relationship. Oh yes, long, long, oh. long, long prior. Long yeah, prior. Okay, okay. This is nineteen ninety-seven. So we're jumping around a little bit. Oh, yeah. I told you some. Yeah, we jumped ahead about, in about the, the general the, uh, yeah, bankruptcy. Right. Okay. That's that's where that's. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to confuse the listeners. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is this is an editor's problem. <laughs> don't do flash forwards. <laughs> um, so. Okay. We, um, so I went to work at Dundurn, and um, it was... little thumbnail of Dundurn, please. A little thumbnail of Dundurn. This is going to be by far the longest bibliophile episode, by the way. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Um, Dundurn was um, variously known as a privately owned scholarly press. It produced commercial books, the aforementioned ghost stories of Alberta, Saskatchewan, etc., the Canadian trivia books... It was originally founded by Kirk because he was a history teacher 
and there were no High Canadian school books. or university? College. He was at Lambton College. Okay. And there were no books that he could use. So we thought, well, we'll write them and publish them. That's it's cool. Dundurn. Very, that's a, very noble beginning. Yeah. Very noble beginning, no doubts about it. When I came in, he had acquired a, a literary press called Simon and Pierre, and he said, let's create a literary line. So I did. We started a literary line. What's that? Um, I mean, novels? Novels. And trans- plays, short stories? Plays, short stories. Poetry? Didn't do any poetry. Okay. Um, That's a good move. And, <laughs> yes, um, we got rolling, and we changed the marketing. We changed the sales. They were distributed by University of Toronto Press. We uh, worked to solidify that relationship and did. Easy to do. Yeah, they do a distribution for a everybody. Time. Yeah, very, very solid. Very good. That's good. They're they're Cormont's distributor, and the company started to come together. The scholarly stuff and the literary stuff and the and trivia stuff. The trivia stuff. It all started working when it was marketed properly. Right. It could sell properly. Yeah. And um, so it was a successful small company. It was a successful small company, and we two two little things happened. One, uh, Kirk used to have a blackboard in one of the offices and every day he would write 312 days to Armageddon, 311 days. And that was when the loan guarantee program for Ontario publishers was going to run out. Because of Harris? Uh, yes. Okay. So I went to Kirk and I said, I don't think that's good for staff morale. And he said, well, people need to know. And I said, well, you know, I'm pretty sure if we go to the bank, we could probably negotiate our own line of credit. And he said, Mark, it's way more complicated than that. So a few weeks later, we made an appointment with the bank and went in, and in 20 minutes, the loan was converted into a line of credit, and we had no problems anymore. And we were told that the line of credit had a much higher limit than our loan had been. And I said, so if I go out and find an amazing property, literary property, uh, and we need to offer a $50,000 advance, the bank's okay with that? And the man at the bank said, well, we'd like you to talk about it first. And I said, so let's say I, get, I convinced Margaret Atwood to come over to Dundurn. He said, we'd fund that. Could I meet her, please? And I said, talk to you later. And uh, literally the following week at our pub board, Barry Jowett, who then worked for Dundurn, brought a letter from the management of Celine Dion. And the letter was, we've published this book, this biography of Celine, en français in Quebec. We've sold, you know, 900,000 copies. Worldwide? In Quebec. Just in Quebec. Just in Quebec. Wait a sec. That's like it, one in five people. Yeah, no, it was, it was some insane number, though. It wasn't 900. I don't remember yeah, the exact okay. number. But it was an insane number. Yeah. And um, would you be interested in bidding on the English language translation rights? And Kirk said, we don't have a hope in hell of getting this. Barry put the letter down, and I looked over, and the letter was written by somebody I'd gone to McGill with. And I said, Kirk? The McGill Mafia. I'll just call up Barry Garber and see what he says. So I called up Barry Garber, and he said, no, <laughs> the best offer wins, Mark, but put one in. So I said, send over the manuscript. So they sent over the manuscript. I read it over the weekend. And our offer wasn't just money and promotion and what we intended to do. Our offer was an explanation of what was wrong with the manuscript, including... The free, ed- free editorial advice. Including concerns that they violated copyright in multiple places. And legal advice. So when we met with them, they said, what kind of a copyright violation? And I said to the lawyers, well you reprint an entire note from Barbara Streisand, you didn't get permission for that note. And the fellow said, Mark, it's Celine's. She wrote it to Celine. It's hers. And I said, no, 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 no. The ink on the paper is Celine's. The words are Barbara Streisand's. And you legally need to get copyright permission. And I'm pretty sure that Barbara... How long was the note? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And I said, I'm pretty sure Barbara Streisand ain't going to give you permission. And they said... Oh, good thing she doesn't read French. So we walked out of the room, and they said, come back. 
You got it. It's yours. Nobody else bothered to read the manuscript. No one else bothered to look at it carefully. You cared about us. That's all that matters. And so we got the book, and we went to the bank and said, um, we need $40,000. <laughs> Just so long as I can meet Celine Dion. Uh, he didn't ask to meet Celine Dion, but he was pretty impressed that we were going to be publishing her book. <laughs> and how'd that do? It did very well. It did very Worldwide? well. Worldwide? Uh, we had worldwide English language rights, but um, I was only there for the Canadian publishing part because... Four months later you left. Not quite four months, but yes. I got a phone call from Jan Geddes, who was one of the two owners yeah. of Cormorant Books at that time. The other owner was Stoddard Publishing. And Jan said, how would you like to be publisher of Cormorant? And I said, wow, um, I didn't think you'd have enough money to hire a publisher. What are you going to do, Jan? And she said, I'm retiring, but if you want to be publisher, you have to buy my shares. So um, my partner John and I talked about it. We looked at it one way and another, and together with a third person, we bought Jan's shares. What about Gary's shares? Uh, Gary was out of the picture. He'd been out of the picture since 1995. Okay. And by now we're into 2000. And um, um, Jan owned 60% of the company. Stoddard owned 40%. And the funny thing about that is now there's a flashback to make things complicated with the flash Just so forwards. you're aware. Yeah. Back to 1995, okay. when I worked at Stoddard, <laughs> on my desk landed a project, thumbs up or thumbs down, and the project was, does Stoddard buy Cormorant books? And I wrote up my assessment, which Wait a was... that was only... You were only there for a short period. I was there for a short period. That's a coincidence. I was... Well, I was senior staff. But I... And what I wrote was, yes, but only by 40%. And I gave a rationale for doing that. Little and Angel is somewhere at work there. Up until then, Jack had always bought either 100% or 51%. But he bought 40%. Nice. And that happened after I left. Uh, so here we are back in 2000. 2001, the three new owners of 60% take over. Jack, Stoddard, Stoddard Publishing owned 40%. They were two very rocky years because those were the years that general publishing, general distribution services was sliding into bankruptcy. It was awful. Why is that? Because I was on the Titanic as it was going down. And there comes a point when there's nothing you can do. Jack tried everything, but the mistake had been made three years earlier, and it was one of those fatal blows that could not be recovered from. So how did that so affect Cormorant? We lost $75,000, and that's at a final accounting. I lost all administration, sales, marketing, and distribution. And what does that mean? Our sales force was the Stoddard Sales Force. Uh, our distribution was General Distribution Services. Our marketing was the publicity <laughs> department at Stoddard Publishing. So, All gone. So you might as well have not bought those shares and just started out from scratch. Exactly. I didn't even get a desk or a chair out of it. We mm. got extraordinarily good advice. One of our board members at the time was a lawyer, Carl Jaffrey, and he said, I know something about this subject, but you know, I'm going to refer you to somebody who's good. And we met this, with this lawyer for two hours, and we, I followed his advice to a T. And we Who's pulled he? Harold Sterling, uh, and he gave us Sterling advice. And I pulled up a truck to the front door of Stoddard Publishing, and I took out all the files for Cormorant Books. I took out the computers I could put my hands on that belonged to us, the printer that, put, that belonged to us, and every piece of paper that belonged to us, and what left. The books? Uh, the books were in the warehouse. And you couldn't get those. Couldn't touch those. Because the, what, the... Uh, the receiver had them. Right. So, um, we did, however, we were able to move the, um, our books from General Distribution Services to University of Toronto Press, time being run by Carolyn Wood. She was the VP of distribution there. They took the books in, and it was chaos for them because a lot of the publishers at General Distribution Services moved to University of Toronto Press. Mm -hmm. And so... They had 
at the busiest time of year when new books are coming in, mm. they had all these hundreds of thousands of books, literally probably a million units coming in. Whew. What, into their warehouse? Into their warehouses. And they have enough room? Or? They had enough room, mm. but at the same time, this is the time of, this was the time of year when courses, colleges and universities need their books for their courses. And Carolyn Wood and Carol Trainer, I called and said, we need these books to these courses. And because they didn't know where half the books were, Carol Trainer and Carolyn Wood climbed over mountains of boxes to find the books to ship to 18 different colleges and universities. The Cormorant book? For Cormorants, yeah. They, Cormorant? Cormorant. 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 That's French? No, it's a bird. It's an English no, I know it's word. a bird. I call cormorant. it a cormorant. Cormorant? Okay. <laughs> Maybe there's a little PK page in me. <laughs> no, I think that's more kind of European, uh, <laughs> continental, and uh, but. Um, uh, and you should actually you should know you should know. So I, I'll just shut up. So uh, we moved into UTP, and for. One year and some months, I ran Cormorant out of my home. It was hard scrabble, okay. very difficult. Some booksellers were amazing. When was that? What the this would be from August 2002 okay. to September 2003. So Nino Ricci's uh, Lives of the Saints. That had been published in 1990. Na 1990, yeah. So that yeah. big, big success is, is well behind us. Well you. behind us, yeah. Okay. So what's, uh, what successes have you experienced then, uh, the big ones, the highlights? The highlights? The last 20 years. There are a variety of highlights. Mm -hmm. There are the obvious ones. Um, being, having a title shortlisted for the Giller Prize. Our first one was Beyond Measure by Pauline Holdstock in 2004. Uh, then in 2006, having two on the shortlist, Carol Lindley's Homeschooling and Pascal Kiviger's uh, The Perfect Circle, which is translated by from the French by Sheila Fishman. Ah, Those are you, Sheila, just recently. Definite highlights. Okay. Definite highlights. It's all about prizes, eh? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm trying to get through all of it. Cormorant, in three years, we won the Canadian Booksellers Association Small Press of the Year Award. Yes, um, that's great. I think there are only three or four presses that have ever done that. A Nancy. Why do you think you won it? Because we published books they liked and they were able to sell. I think that's it. Uh, certainly, one year that we won was definitely related to the double Giller Prize and nominees. Yeah. Another year, I think it was related to publishing Emma's for Moose by Charlie Bachter. Another great highlight. That's a wonderful book. Working with Charlie, wonderful, wonderful. Big friends with um, uh, Margaret Atwood. I believe they are. He uh, illustrated... Uh, the Susanna, Susanna Moody book, Moody? which we also ended up reissuing. Oh, did you? And okay. we reissued... It was published originally by McFarlane, Walter, and Ross as... The that journals, the one in the slipcase? That's the one in the slipcase, yeah. the journals of Susanna Moody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we reissued it, saw a slipcase, uh, and instead of having all the essays at the front, we moved them to the back, put the artwork front, mm -hmm. and I emailed Margaret Atwood and said, would it be okay if we called it the illustrated... Journals of Susanna Moody by Charles Pachter and Margaret Atwood. And Margaret Atwood said, we should have done that in the first place. <laughs> and that is, of course, what we did. Oh, that's lovely. And that's, Charles gets the headline here. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's his illustrations. It's sure. a notebook. book. Wonderful to work with. He really, really was. Margaret was a joy to work with. Smart. Actually, you put, you put oh, yeah, she's... Uh, and nice. I totally agree with you. Um, She's great. Yeah. Uh, so you actually put the kind of production, a uh, little, a little story of the production of the yes the book in here as yeah. well. I like that. Yeah. No, it's yeah. a it's a project I'm really proud of. Uh -huh. um, what year was that? I think that's 2015. Okay. You have to look at the copyright. Where'd you get this printed? Friesens. Charles Pachter is a very serious. Canadian nationalist. When we did Emma's for Moose, he said, promise me you'll only print in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I said, no problem. And when I did the costing, um, we had to print no fewer than 7,000 copies to make it affordable. 
And I thought, 7,000 copies. Of course we can do 7,000 copies. Canadian children's books, they sell like hotcakes. And um, when we sent the book off to press in August of 2008, uh, that weekend, my partner John and I were visiting Jack and Nancy Stoddard at their cottage. And there was another guest there, Catherine Mitchell, who had worked in children's publishing and knew it inside out, upside down and backwards. And Catherine said, oh, Mark, I wish I thought of doing something like Emma's for Moose with Charlie. Brilliant idea, stunning. Everybody in the industry thinks it's just, it's a total winner. And I said, oh, good, I hope it sells well, because we printed 7,000 copies. And the blood drained from her face, and she said, you'll be lucky to sell 4,000. And I said, but I thought Canadian Children's Illustrated books did really well. Mm -hmm. And Catherine said, 7,000 is really unusual. <clears throat> and then she tried to explain to us that I'd done it all wrong. We should have printed in China, da 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 da. But you couldn't. But Charlie and I had agreed we're going to print in Canada. Well, we sold 7,000 copies in the first month. I had to reprint by the end of September. That's pretty uh, lousy. Yeah. Isn't it? It was heaven. It was absolute heaven. So that was a great moment in publishing. There's no arguing the Marrow themes. Yeah. Stellar success. Stellar success. Internationally? Um, well, we sold the French language rights to Boreal before it won any awards. Boreal jumped That's on board immediately. Yeah. So they're, they're in France now? They're in, uh, it's in Quebec and in France. Yeah. Cherie's agent asked us if we would allow her agent to um, sell foreign rights. So we made an agreement and they managed to sell UK and um, German rights so far. Nothing in the US? Nothing. Oh no, we, we sell it in the US as well. You do? No, we do, yes, 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 yes. You sell the book that the book. you Finished published book and that printed? Published. Yes. That's what made it eligible for the Kirkus Prize, which it won. First Canadian book to win the Kirkus Prize. So you got another one coming out right now, right? She does, indeed, yes. So you're all over that? No, that's not us. That's Random House. Oh, fuck. Yeah. That upset you or not? Wasn't well, my happiest moment in publishing. You could have handled it. I couldn't have afforded the advance they gave her. Which brings me to my conclusion. If the federal government funded some kind of program that allowed you to pay the advances that the multinationals do. Would that help? That's an interesting concept. And wow. Yes, it could help, but it would be very difficult because it's still kind of gambling. I think the federal government would do better to enforce its own rules and regulations. There's black letter law in Ontario that books bought and sold in Ontario must come from a Canadian warehouse. Okay. Well, Random House is distributed out of Maryland. They're breaking the rules? They're breaking the law. Okay. Not the rules, the law. Okay. And nobody bothered to enforce that law. Um, and I did write to Kathleen Wynne and her various attorneys general, and no one wrote back. What about Doug? Doug. Ford. Um, I suppose I could write to him, but I don't think he's going to do anything you about it. You never know. Just pick up the phone. That's what he's known for. Yeah, that's true. Since then, you know, HarperCollins has shut down its Canadian distribution unit. Yeah, but that's and not that's not uh, germane to what we were just talking about. Well, is it, it? It, it is in a way because if if everybody had to play by the rules and the laws, a Random House wouldn't be making as much money. And shipping it out, out yeah. of the country. Out of the country. To, well, not sh and, and shipping it out of the country. But not only that, you know... But how does them, printing how books does them to, storing their books... Uh, and distributing them out of Maryland? No, no, out of uh, Ontario. How does that help you? Well, we have a minimum wage considerably higher than Maryland. Their expenses would be higher. They wouldn't have that kind of money to throw around. Okay. So it's an even playing field. A more even playing field. Right. That's what um, you're after. Yeah. Okay. And um, I, I maintain, 
and I may be wrong, but I maintain that the publishing of Canadian authored books is not the business of the foreign authored co of the foreign owned companies. Well, they that's just, the winding they, dress. That's the window dressing. They just skim off the big selling authors. No, they do. Give, they sometimes publish original people that the first time people, mm -hmm. but they get dibs on everybody because they have more money. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Wouldn't it help if the federal government had some program to help even that out? Well, one would argue that's what the Book Canada Book Fund and all the, all the funding agencies are supposed to do. But it is thin gruel on which publishers survive. It is not a hearty, calorie-rich meal that allows us to mm -hmm. do those kinds of things. But it, 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 and, and at the moment, the funding skews towards quantity over quality. Right. But it also loses, loses you your, your prize author yeah authors authors Joseph Boyden you know, you can, there's, there's a list there's a long list over the history of the company and the reason they go is because even if they don't sell they still get the advance the, yeah. that's the only reason well I don't know if that's the only I reason I mean obviously there's would, an infrastructure that's international and there's an infrastructure that's international I don't know how much that helps people um and, you know, just there, this opens up a can of worms. But, for example, <clears throat> when the Merrill Thieves was selected for Canada Reads, the Toronto Public Library had 18 copies. They upped their holdings to 33 copies. The books published by Random House were, in, were 100 copies. So I argued with the Toronto Public Library. What do you mean, the books that were on the Canada Reads yes, list? Yes, that, that were published so that by Random House. That, why did the Toronto Library buy that many? Of their books and, and not, not ours? yours? That's a question they have yet to answer. But, of interest, they finally got up to 90 copies okay. of Marathines. Okay. So, <clears throat> there's still... So this, is, this is another a tangent here? This is a tangent. Okay. But it's an important one. Uh, there are still 90 people on hold. The book is two, you know, two and a half years old now. Yeah, well, they should buy the damn book. They, many people have. But uh, with uh, Cherie's new book, the opening order was 140 copies for the Toronto Public Library. Okay. That's significantly more than the 90 they have for a book that was on Canada Reads. <clears throat> Why did they do that? 140 is a lot more than 90. Yeah, but you're upset about 50 books? Multiply that over an entire list. Multiply that by 20 years. Okay. In 2004, beyond measure, there were 69 copies in the Toronto Public Library with something like 4,000 holds. And the Random House books that year were all in the hundreds and hundreds of copies. And when I wrote to the librarian, I got no answer. I did eventually end up... So again, you know what this <laughs> is, of course. It's an even playing field argument. Yes, it's an even playing field argument. And it's a, why the hell aren't you buying Canadian books? Yeah. Published by Canadian period. publishers, period. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and as I said, you said... Well, maybe just... they don't want to... Their, their, their patrons don't want to read the, the Canadian 4, books. 4,000 holds for beyond measure. Okay, okay. No, 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 no. Hundreds of holds. At its peak, there were hundreds of holds for, for um, Marathies. Yeah, yeah. And they stayed the course. Okay, so what's the solution? One of the solutions is, I think... Enforce regulations. We have to enforce a lot of regulations yeah. and laws. Yeah. Um, you know, Quebec... As do, France does the best of any country in the world. Yeah. No discounting books. Uh, if you own a property that has a bookstore in it, yeah. you pay no property tax. tax. Yeah. Um, we need to do these kinds of things mm -hmm. because we need bookstores. And we need to say to Amazon, sorry, you can't discount books. Yeah. Um, or you can discount them. I think the government's even money. running a, an anti-Amazon campaign. In France. In France. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because these, you know, we need to do those kinds of things. Here's a crazy thing. Uh, we got 
an inquiry from an American wholesaler to buy 1,200 copies of Marrow Themes for an Ontario school board. Just think about the environmental impact. The books are printed in Winnipeg, they're shipped to Toronto, then they're shipped from Toronto to Washington State, which is where our U.S. distributor is, and then they'd be shipped back to Toronto. And the Toronto School Board was able to get them cheaper out of Washington? No. So why did they buy them out of there then? I don't know why, but it's a good question. They weren't cheaper. That's just dumb then. Yeah. In but the end, we killed, we killed that sale and we required them to buy in Canada. Okay. But you can't monitor your sales with that kind of a fine tooth comb. Any other solutions? Just basically look at France. Would be a good look at France would be a good one. And, and just look copy, at Quebec, what they're copy doing. what they do in Quebec, Quebec. And, Fra and France. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, you know, uh, the libraries should be ordering Canadian books. And when the Toronto Public Library is responsible for the Toronto Book Prize, uh, you, there is no sadder event in the world than the awarding of the Toronto Book Prize. Because there are a motley group of people, mostly just publishers, publicists, and the nominees attending. And um, if you're lucky, the mayor turns up, hands it, out the prize, and that's it. And this is the Toronto Public Library system doing it. You mean they're not putting enough effort behind marketing those? Zero thing? effort. Zero. Okay. And I wrote to them once and I said, why? You've got 99 branches. Do you think you are a gadfly? Is it you being a gadfly here? Or is a gadfly a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I'd say kind of neutral, but slightly shit disturbing, but and enjoying that. No, I don't enjoy it because I lose you so just, many of these you battles. Just, you're just angry. Um, disappointed and yeah. saddened. Okay. I mean, one of the things that has always driven me when I was in grade 10 or grade 9 in Vancouver, our history teacher stood, it was grade 9, stood at the front of the classroom. World War II began on December 7th, 1941. I put up my hand. No, it didn't. Try September 3rd. No, December 7th. Argument. It's in your textbook. It was. It's in your American textbook. Your American textbook. So I go home. Mom, when did World War II begin? Why are you asking such a crazy question? So I tell her. So she phones the principal of the school, who is a Polish immigrant, and says, Bill, when did World War II begin? And he says, well, well, the invasion of Poland, September 1st, 1939. Why do you ask? This is what's being taught in your class. So, following day in class, we are told, World War II started on December 7th, 1941. Prior to that was a phony war during which time the European powers positioned themselves for war. It's an American teacher? Is that an American teacher, about? American teacher, American textbook. Okay. okay. If a country doesn't know its own history, kind of screwed. I also doesn't have, have much of an identity. Doesn't have much of an identity. You know, back to that old question, where is here? Yeah. And all the important stuff happens elsewhere, mm. right? And I happen to think, and I read fairly widely, I read French literature, I read British literature, I read American literature, I used to read a hell of a lot of South, uh, Latin American literature. Canada produces truly great writers and truly great writing. And we have amazing books. Some of them may not be Nobel quality, but my God, Reading a book about indigenous people in Vancouver, you know, on, the, on the West Coast, dealing with the after effects of the residential school system and how they deal with it posit positively. Mm -hmm. We need to do that far more than we need to read John Grisham, James Patterson, or even you're being prescriptive here. Right? I am being prescriptive, and but we always are. You can't are. force Canadians to do that. No, prescriptive it doesn't mean forcing. It means... It, it, no, I was taking it to the next step. But no, you don't step. want to force people to read things, but it's like so many Canadians grow up going to Disney World or Disneyland. They go south for their holidays. They've never seen Louisburg or Ottawa or Banff or Lake Louise mm. or... You know, 
just this incredible, if nothing else, drive across the country once in your life. Mm -hmm. And when you come out of the foothills and you suddenly see this enormous expanse of prairie, it takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. Stop in the little towns. Meet. Don't, don't go to the McDonald's. Go to the little cafeteria. The diner. The diners. You meet people. Mm -hmm. I got to do that multiple times. Thank you, Mom and Dad. Um, and I've seen the countryside, you know, coast to coast. It's an incredible place. And I'm not saying it's better than. It's, it's, but it's our own. And one of the things that drives me back to being to, to the publishing stuff is, no, World War II began with the invasion of Poland by the Germans. The British and the French jumped in the fray, and it took Canada you know, a few days to catch yeah. up. But we were in there right at the beginning, right at the beginning. That's yeah. our history. Our history also includes some shameful things. We did not let Jewish refugees into Canada. Mm. We incarcerated the Japanese. And what we did to the indigenous people is, you know... Shameful. It's shameful. But if you don't know your history, you can't start fixing it. Mm -hmm. You can't go forward and make things better. That's part of what drives me. Part of what drives me is the idea that one day people... If, if you read every Cormorant book, you'll have in your imagination a map of Canada that is wildly different from the map that's on the front wall of the classroom. But it's lit up by stories and by details. And it's it's a country worth living in and caring about. Well, well thank you for um, the overview and uh, your commitment to, uh, to publishing in Canada. I've been speaking to Mark Cote, who is the publisher and editor yep. of Comer Ant. <laughs> Comer Ant. However you want to say it. Comer Ant. Books based in Toronto. Based in Toronto. Canada. Thanks again. Thank you.